Please join me in welcoming Graham Allison to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Graham, thanks for joining us, and thanks for agreeing to follow that routine. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Allison was founding dean of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and remains a professor of government. He's a leading analyst of US national security and defense policy with a special interest in nuclear weapons and terrorism. He's most famous as the assistant secretary of defense for policy and plans from 1993 to 94, where he coordinated strategy and policy towards the states of the former Soviet Union. Bill Clinton awarded him the, Demo uh, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service for reshaping relations with Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan to reduce the former Soviet nuclear arsenal. And he's since become the longest serving member of the Secretary of Defense's Defense Policy Board, having served for eight Secretaries of Defense. And he's the only person to receive the Department of Defense's highest civilian award from both Reagan and Clinton administrations. Graham is one of the world's most cited experts on the uh, bureaucratic analysis of decision making, especially during times of crisis. Um, I read his book, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap, which uh, was published in 2018 and I think was very prescient uh, about the moment that we're in today. A couple of weeks ago, Elon Musk tweeted out several times that everyone should read this book. So congrats, we get a little promotion from Elon as well. But <laughs> Thank that, you. That must have helped sales, congrats on that. Um, the theory that when one great power threatens to displace another, war is almost always the result, is at the heart of his analysis on the US-China relationship. During the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides wrote, what made war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear which this caused in Sparta. And Graham says the trap triggered nearly every war, from the Peloponnesian War to World War I, to the War of the Spanish Succession, the Thirty Years' War, and now threatens to light the world on fire once again. Graham, thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, if you wouldn't mind just frame for the audience and for us here on stage the point that you make in your book about Thucydides' trap and where we find uh, the relationship between China and the US taking us and where it specifically sits in that evolution of, of call it temperament, temperament <laughs> today. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm a fan of your podcast, and I think how you've made this thing work, I don't quite understand, but I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We that. have a friend in the deep state. He's sitting over there. <laughs> We're not going to name names, okay. but he made the introduction, and, and we appreciate it. Yeah. In any case, it's a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. So, and the summary you gave, <laughs> I think, is a, is a very good place to start. Let me do four or five quick bottom lines. So, first... Uh, uh, as I wrote in this book, which was published just as Reagan, be sorry, as uh, Trump became president, uh, uh, in relations between US and China, expect things to get worse before they get worse. <laughs> so that's exactly what I would say today. And why? What's driving that? This is a classic lucidity and rivalry. So as David said, Thucydides taught us 2,500 years ago, when a rapidly rising power seriously threatens to displace a ruling power, shit happens. Now that's normal. And in most cases, the outcome is war. So what we're seeing today and what we're gonna see even more intensely tomorrow and a decade from now is the fiercest rivalry history has ever seen. China is not just another great power, but it's gonna be the biggest power in the history of the world. The U.S. is a colossal ruling power, which has been the architect and guardian of the international order that allows us to live today in the 78th year without great power war, a pretty amazing accomplishment. And so the U.S. is not going to fade away uh, comfortably. Uh, when that confrontation occurs, most often the outcome is war. In the book I look at the last 500 years, there's 16 times we've seen a rapidly rising power threaten a colossal ruling power. Think of Germany's rise beginning of the 20th century and the challenge to Great Britain, that became World War I. So most often, 
Of the 16 cases, 12 ended in war, four ended in no war. So if we were just doing statistics, war is not inevitable, it's just structurally likely. And the cases in which war didn't occur were cases in which somehow the parties managed a degree of strategic imagination that bent otherwise trends, or what you called earlier the physics of the situation. Uh, so, the Cold War, I'm an old Cold War year. In the rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union that had dominated 40, decade, 40 years of American history, the US and uh, the Soviet Union came to the edge of war multiple times, Cuban Missile Crisis, about which I've written a book, The Most Dangerous. But there was ultimately no hot war, okay? Well, that's a big deal. Had there been a hot war, we wouldn't be having this podcast. Los Angeles wouldn't be here. Boston wouldn't be here. So a real war, a real bloody war, is catastrophic. It could be in today absolutely catastrophic. So what I said to David when he invited me to come was, uh, you folks are in the business of strategic imagination. I mean, that's what you do. That's how you've come to have a degree of confidence in what you do. You imagine something that seems slightly crazy, it seems almost unimaginable. Somehow you put pieces together. Uh, some of the time it works, and lo and behold, yikes. Our life has got smartphones, or it has the net, or it has AI, or it has vaccines, or it has, it has, it has. Amazing. So I'm hoping that you'll devote some of those gray cells to the geopolitical challenge that China poses to the U.S. today, which will be the dominant geopolitical challenge for the rest of our lives. I don't think there's anything inevitable about the outcome. I think, though, if we settle for diplomacy as usual, or statescraft as usual, or imagination as usual, then we should expect history as usual. But that's not... That, that's the trend, that's not inevitable. So if you ask me bottom line quickly, a war between US and China in the year ahead, a no. I'll give you 99% on that one. War between the US and China the next four years, no. I'd say 90%, uh, no, okay? War between the US and China over the decades ahead if both stay on the current paths, uh, I don't like that. Okay. Mm. We, we have it seemed like three decades of incredible collaboration uh, with China and the West and America specifically, and just look at what happened with the iPhone and the number of people who, who um, rose out of poverty um, in China. And it seemed to be going really well. And it seemed like you know, the NBA was playing games there and we were sending movies there. Everything seemed to be on the right track. And then something has, seems to have gone horribly wrong. And a two-part question, what has gone horribly wrong? Why has this happened so quickly? Because it seems like it's changed since COVID in such a rapid fashion um, that it's caught us all by surprise how this has come apart. And um, what does China want that we don't seem to understand? Okay, two great questions and I'll try to be brief. So. Uh, maybe in your world, the better way to think of it is to have an established, entrenched uh, a company and a disruptive upstart. Got it. When the disruptive upstart is 1% of the business, welcome. 5% of the business, welcome. 10% of the business. Now it's moving faster and rap more rapidly. All of a sudden, one begins to think, wait a minute, where, where is this going? Could it actually imagine it will displace me. Mm. So China was, at the beginning of the century, 10% of the US GDP. Today, it's three quarters of the US GDP. So it's quite plausible that China will have a larger GDP, even by market exchange rates, than the US. Well, wait a minute, we're number one. That's part of who we are. So in a Thucydidean dynamic, basically the seesaw of power begins to shift. Think of a seesaw on a kid's playground. The guy with the bulk is on one end, the little guy's on the other end, he begins bulking up, all of a sudden the seesaw begins moving. Mm. The dynamics of that is Thucydides' trap. Mm. So the perception changes. I used to look down on you, now I'm having to look you in the eye, I'm looking up. The psychology changes. Who the hell do you think you are? 
I created the environment in which you grew up. You should be appreciative. Yeah, we let you okay? make our You iPhones. should take your space, yeah. okay? Excuse me, our normal place is to be running the show and your normal place is to take your seat at the table. So we, many, many people imagine that China would just follow the paths of Germany and Japan and take their place in the American-led international order. That was a pretty good idea, except they hadn't thought very carefully about history. Germany and Japan were defeated by the U.S. of the war and occupied by the U.S. And then we wrote their constitution. And then we produced a kind of training school. So China wants to be, this is Lee Kuan Yew's line, China wants to be respected as China, not as an honorary member of the West. Okay? What uh, happened in the late 90s, because it started with Clinton, where it seemed like a good idea to admit to the WTO and then Bush kind of just, you know, put the nail in the coffin and did it and actually supported it. We could have not supported it. Um, some people say it was a trade-off for China's support for the Iraq war, who knows. But the point is, it happened. But I'm sure you guys were sitting in the engine room scenario planning what happens if this happens. And it's fair to say that from that context, we didn't necessarily get it right. right. So what did you get wrong? Well, it, again, it's good to go back to 2000 and just to remember, in 2000, China was somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of U.S.'s GDP. The people in 2000, 80 percent of the people in China were trying to live on $2 a day. So the place is a miserable, struggling mess. The U.S. has been in the business ever since World War II of trying to encourage economic development in countries. So Clinton and Bush together, Clinton said about the WTO, it's a win-win-win situation. It's going to be a win for everybody. China is going to be lifted up. That's what we would like to do because people's lives will be better. And actually, there's been an anti-poverty miracle in China that as human beings we have to admire. People that used to get a few calories now get enough calories to eat. That's, it. That's got to be a good right. thing. The idea that this might work so successfully that China could become, uh, could, could come to have an economy as large as ours didn't occur to anybody at the time. You could see a few, few people as outliers, but that was just kind of not in the imagination. And then secondly, this was in a period of great hubris in the U.S. We had won the Cold War. We were living in this uh, a bubble which... Uh, you know, the, famous, the most famous thesis of the period was Frank Fukuyama's End of History. So everybody has become democracies and market yeah. economies, and if they have McDonald's, they can't have wars because people would prefer to get hamburgers than wars. Okay? You can hardly say that today without laughing, but that was sort of well-known, that was conventional wisdom at the time. So if you had come along and said that, wait a minute, if China is very successful, it's going to come to have a GDP about the size of the U.S., and then it's going to have, back to your question, it's going to have its own aspirations. The Chinese have a view, understandably, and Ray uh, talked about this earlier today. Sorry, for four or 5,000 years, they were the predominant power in all the world they knew. So their story is the normal conditions of things is that we're at the, through their Confucian, so hierarchy, harmony and peace comes through hierarchy. They're at the top of the hierarchy. That's the normal place. They were displaced from this by Westerners with technology 150 years ago. They call that the century of humiliation. And their aspiration is to go back to normal. And normal so, for them is China is the, quote, center of the universe. China is the sun around which the others, there's, you know, as you remember their, their, their thing about, uh, you know, you can't have two tigers in the valley. There's right. the big one and the other one. So I, I have two comments. The first is just a reaction to this. I'm sort of on the opposite side of you, which is that because of China's population woes and because of, I think, some of these technological things that are sort of on the horizon, I believe that we're sort of at the edge of an era of abundance that will create a massive peace dividend because a lot of the justifications for war go away. That's my personal view. But yep. I have taken the time to try to steel man your point of view, which is we go to war. And the best steel man that I can come up with is very practical, so I'd like you to try to dismantle Please. it. Which is, you have massive youth unemployment in China and waning growth. And so the simplest and most reductive way for China to basically grow and to appease, you know, 25% of young people, mostly men, from not uprising, is to essentially create demand. And the best way to create demand is to essentially create, you know, a war machine. And that is why they go to war. Is that... I would say uh, 
I appreciate that option. I've worked very hard on the 12 scenarios for getting to war. If there's a war between the US and China in the next year or four years or decade, how is it gonna happen in my view, the most likely, not this way? It's gonna happen the same way the last war happened. Now if I were to take a quiz here, since I know we live in the United States of amnesia, okay. Uh, but uh, when was the last war between the US and China? I'm not gonna give you a quiz, but I'll tell you the answer is 1950. What? Okay, and what happened? In 1950, uh, North Korea attacked South Korea, uh, almost pushed them off the whole peninsula. The US had just won World War II. That's five years after the end of World War II. MacArthur and American troops were in Japan. They came to the rescue of South Korea. They pushed the North Koreans right back up the peninsula. And the 38th parallel, which had been the starting point, they pushed right across without even thinking and were pushing right towards the Chinese border, the Yalu. Right. So you're now one year, this is 1950, one year after Mao has just won the Chinese Civil War. He hasn't even consolidated his position. The US is Superman. We've just dropped two bombs next door in Japan the end of World War II, have a monopoly of nuclear power. The likely, the possibility that China would attack the US it was unimaginable, hmm. certainly to MacArthur. But Mao, seeing the US coming up to his border and not knowing wherever else he might stop, sent his peasant army to war with the US and beat the Americans right back down the peninsula to the 38th parallel. Where the, so wars happen often not because anybody wants a war. At the beginning of 1950, if you'd gone to Mao and said, I got a good idea, once you go to a war with Superman, he would have said, right. you're out of your mind. If you'd gone to Truman, in 1950, say, how about we have a war? Forget about it. But so you don't have to have an intention of either of the parties. I think the most likely way war will happen in the US and China, something happens in Taiwan, either we're unduly provocative or the Taiwanese provocative. Uh, I'm, gonna, sure. I'm gonna hand it yeah. to Sachs, but I wanna just make one comment, get your reaction. Yeah. If, if that's the framing, what about India? because now India's ascendant, it's got a growing population, it's got huge economic growth, and unlike China, who's not necessarily ever been subjugated in a war, the Indians have this memory of basically having Judeo-Christians that dominated that region, right. of which we all had to get liberty, which is almost even worse, maybe. So just frame India in that context then. Well, another great question, and again, nobody knows, but the Indian story, Either, theory one, India is about to become a serious rival to China. That's the fashionable story today. Theory two is India is the country of the future and will always be so. So we've been through already five of these cycles before where we declared India was about to rise rapidly and lo and behold, India turns out to be India. So India has a lot of internal problems itself. As was mentioned earlier today, about 20% of the population are Muslims. Uh, Modi is basically undermining the multi-ethnic democracy that Nehru had built by getting support from the majority by oppressing the minority. So that's a complicated problem within, and a lot of other comp components. So if you look at the rivalry between the US and India in the 20th century and just graph it, you discover that lo and behold, in every uh, year virtually, and every decade for sure, the gap between them has grown in China's favor. Now, not this year. India is growing much faster than China this year and last year and maybe next year, so we can look at the trajectories. I think it's quite possible, and I think the American strategy, which I think is the right one, is that this is a long run game, a long game. So there's gonna be a long rivalry between US and China. Uh, we believe that a more uh, liberty-centered, uh, uh, open uh, democratic political system will perform better over the long run than a party-led autocracy. She has a different idea. He says things are too chaotic, information is too uncertain. Uh, you can't let people just, my God, let people vote and look and see what happens in the US. Right. So we need to have uh, order. And so our party-led autocracy, we believe is gonna do, well, we play this out over time. If the US had to play this game only US versus China, I think we lose. But if the US plays this game with a group of allied and aligned, of whom we now see in the Quad, India and Australia, 
in Japan and in, right. in AUKUS. We see Britain and Australia and the US. And in the trilateral that we just saw with Japan and South Korea. So you're seeing a configuration. I, I call it more guys on our side of the seesaw. And that can go over a long period of time. And it may turn out that democracies uh, fail internally. I mean, I think it's a big challenge. And I think there's no certainty about that. It may turn out that autocracies fail yep. in the way autocracies have, have historically failed. I think it's an incredible framing because you have an autocracy in China and a democracy here, and then somewhat democratic is how we're, I think, describing India right now. Is India the most important relationship for America to get right at this moment in time? Is that the relationship we really need to be focusing on since that seems like it's the linchpin or the fulcrum? Well, I would say... Uh, that's a good question, and I'm not sure. I've, I, I uh, am probably unduly skeptical about Israel, uh, I mean, sorry, about India, because my impressions are overly shaped by uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew was the founder and builder of Singapore, and he, his great hope was for India, mm. but ultimately he became to be despairing of its internal complexities. Modi seems to be a different character, if you looked at the way he ran the province that he had run before, the state, he was very effective. He's very ambitious for India, so I'm hopeful about India. If India emerges, it has the potential alongside, I don't think only India, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New uh, Zealand, and even Japan, maybe the Europeans, South again, Korea. depending on what happens here. So you could have a group of allied and aligned, not all agreeing on everything, but agreeing on enough that says we're, we're trying to make, we're trying the complex problem of governing a society, we believe has to start with the freedom and liberty of people. That's mm -hmm. what we think is, and we think that's essential for the dynamism of innovation and invention, and lo and behold, there's a lot of evidence for that. And if we're the freest and most open society, lo and behold, a bunch of people come from other countries where they're not so free, and they do their thing here. I'd say thank God for that, okay? Uh, so under those circumstances, played out over a long run, you can imagine, imagine a story that turns out pretty well. In the case of the U.S. and Soviet Union, just to remember, it's hard to believe, but if you go back and read your economic textbook that was published in the 1960s, Samuelson was the, you know, basically for economics. It says by the 70s, the Soviet Union will have overtaken the U.S. economy. Right. Yeah. That was kind of a well-known yeah, fact. Why didn't well, lo that and behold, happen? Lo and behold, it didn't. Okay. Is, is the reason it didn't happen is because dictatorships have a hard time in the long term versus democracies? Right. Well, there's about 10 reasons why there's weaknesses in an autocracy. And you're now seeing a lot of evidence of it in the Chinese system, particularly after Xi became even more autocratic in guaranteeing his lease on life with the recent coronation, where he's got his third term unprecedented, but without a term limit. So basically, if I'm the autocrat, and especially if I come to think as, they, as he does, he's got the thought of Xi Jinping, they write this into the Constitution. So this contains all wisdom. One of the problems the guys are having with their AI machines is you can't ask a question that doesn't, that has an answer inconsistent with the thought of Xi Jinping that declares what's true about this and that. Yeah. So he doesn't tell Pine much about mathematics or science, so you can ask those questions. Ten cents AI machine is a pretty good competitor for GPT-4 in the science or, or math. But if you ask a question about, you know, uh, uh, how do freedom-centered societies perform? Mm. It can't answer that question because it, <laughs> the thought of Xi Jinping <laughs> says that, does not compute. That, uh, one reason, another one: if you if you choose people for loyalty mm. more than for competence, mm. look at a company and see how that works. Okay, uh, so seven reasons. Yes. Yes. I think <coughs> uh, one of the points you make in your book is that. Um, and I think your, your, your book came out around the time that China and the U.S. had achieved rough parity in terms of purchasing power parity, their, their GDP. Roughly, yeah. yeah. Roughly. And I remember one of the points you made is that China has four times the population of the U.S., so its per capita GDP was one quarter that of the U.S. If they merely got to the, the point of having half the per capita GDP 
of the U.S., then their economy would be twice as big as ours. Right. And, you know, China has a lot of really smart, hardworking people who are studying subjects that we aren't studying as much as we should in the U.S., like engineering, like yeah. science, and so forth. So um, there are reasons, I think, to believe that their, you know, incredible rise could derail. The demographics are a problem. Maybe the, um, if, if the economy becomes too centrally controlled. But l let's just assume that it does continue its rise. Um, I guess the question would be, uh, will the U.S. have to effectively recognize that they have a sphere of influence in Asia in order to avoid a war? I mean, is that, is that what we're going to have to do? I, I think, uh, so I appreciate your starting with the basics. Yeah. And structural realities are hard to deny. So again, the Americans don't like this, but just do, do the arithmetic. If Chinese are only, if their economy is only half as productive as ours, and these are pretty talented people and they work pretty hard, they'll have a GDP twice ours. I'll do it again. Wait a minute, twice ours. Now you're in a rivalry between A and B, and B has twice the GDP. So it can have twice the size of the defense budget. It can have twice the intelligence budget. Right. It can have twice, 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 okay? Well, you know, <laughs> that's reality. Now, can I find enough allied and aligned on my side to make up for some of that? Yeah, that seems right. Uh, so that's one way. So your alliances could be... So we, we need an be, alliance strategy more than they do. That's if, right. Yeah, okay. We need it, okay. But if you said over time in relationships like that, if you're going to avoid war, will there... Be, I mean, a sphere of influence, again, there's a great ab abstract debate about this, but in reality, the sphere of influence is the shadow that power casts in some realm. So if you're more powerful, you have, a sh you have a sphere of influence. So in the South China Sea today, on the Chinese border, they have more ships, they have more missiles on the land. That can, so lo and behold, uh, we don't care call that their sphere of influence, but if you look and see what happens in the area, yeah. we don't operate our ships the way we did when I was in the Pentagon in the Clinton administration. So if there were an event in Taiwan, which is 90 miles off their shore, like Cuba is on our shore, and halfway around the world for us, the likelihood we're going to have the ships and the planes and the other, excuse me, you know, that just doesn't work that way. You can look at the geography and see the tyranny of it. So will there come to be some degree of difference and accommodation if a war is to be avoided? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Now then we, you know, then it becomes ugly because you say, well, okay, well, in what respect? And I know you guys, I saw earlier, did the question for Robert uh, uh, Kennedy about Taiwan, okay? I think that's a good question not to answer. Not to answer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th this is where I, I, I worry about the um, competence of our foreign policy establishment because I think it only has one gear, which is forward and, and double down. Um, in the United States, we have a doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine, which says that no distant great power can bring troops, weapons, or bases right. into our hemisphere right. because we do not tolerate other great powers having security threats amassed on our border. But our foreign policy establishment cannot comprehend that other great powers want a similar Monroe Doctrine. I think that was a co huge contributor to the war we have in Ukraine right now. Yeah. So we, we, we have this theory. I mean, I'm part of this establishment that you're talking about. And it's, <laughs> and it's not... So why, it's not, did, you, why it's, did you invade Ukraine? <laughs> it's, it's not... That, it's that, not, that, that, it's that's not such as, a gross implication. It's not, a, it's not as uniform yeah. as you say, and it's not, as, uh, not always as unsuccessful as you say. But overall, I think you're more right than wrong. So basically, the, uh, uh, we say we're the exceptional nation. So what does that mean? That means we make the rules, and you're supposed to obey the rules. But we don't obey the rules. So we say we're for the rule-based order. Excuse me, the rule-based order uh, was the basis on which we invaded Iraq? I don't think so. That we occupied Afghanistan? I don't think so. So the U.S. has made a, a lot of mistakes of unnecessary wars. And a lot of the... Un
a, a, lot of, a lot of the unnecessary wars was because people with wrong ideas dominated people with right ideas, but there was a debate and a discussion. So we need more people with the right ideas, you know, getting into the conversation in an active way. But let me just do one other footnote here. So this, uh, you, you, we have to remember, this is 9-11, this is okay? So this is a big day for me, okay? This is a day on which airplanes hijacked by terrorists uh, killed 3,000 people at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, including many people that I know extremely well. Uh, what would a world be like in which that happened every day or every week or every month? We'd be totally intolerable. You wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Why is that not happening? Some people did some right things. So there's been a pretty active program by the U.S., some of it with some mistakes, but overall, that's played a significant role in the fact that people who plan and uh, train to conduct major terrorist attacks on the U.S., are taken off the chessboard. Every day people go out hunting. Every day people find people. And I would say, thank goodness for this. this is well, so so I, th I think that's an interesting point. Um, you know, certainly Al-Qaeda hasn't been able to hit us again in that way. Um, I, I do wonder whether there were two tragedies on 9-11. One was the thousands of people who died. The other was the way that we reacted to it. Um, like you said, we went into Iraq, a total non sequitur. Stupid, yes. Stupid and a non sequitur, and then we stayed in Afghanistan for 20 <clears throat> years. And again, not necessary. Yeah, on sort of the nation-building grounds. We then went into Syria, that's still going on. There was Libya. So it's, and, and there was very little debate about all of these things at the time we made these decisions. It's almost like the U.S. foreign policy establishment in reaction to 9-11 became almost deranged. Um, and I, you know, compared to, say, the 1990s, where I think there were real foreign policy debates, there was a real foreign policy debate in the 90s mm -hmm. on NATO expansion, it doesn't seem like we have that many debates, not within the policy elite. Maybe we're having them, but it doesn't seem like the policy elite debates anything anymore. It's just this, this sort of bellicose, hawkish rhetoric at all times. Do you agree with from that, Graham, from the inside? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, again, I live on the other side. I live on both sides of this curtain. And I would say inside, there's much more debate, and there was much more debate than we take credit for. George Bush made a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake in invading Iraq in, in 2003. Who, who, who said that to him? His father's closest uh, advisor, okay. Brent Scowcroft, mm -hmm. who was joined at the hip with the father, said to him, this is a terrible, dumb mistake. He even went so far as to write an op-ed about it after he had... Now, he did not write an op-ed without talking to Bush's father. Would George H.W. Bush have done this? No. Yeah. If Gore, if the, if the count had gone right in Florida and Gore had been president, would we have gone into Iraq? No. So electing the right president and having the right... Uh, so if it had been the Bush 41 team, rather than the Bush 43 team, we wouldn't have made that mistake. So how, how, you, uh, you mentioned this RFK clip. One of the things that he says is that we've gotten things backwards now, where there's a military industrial complex that essentially wants to maximize revenue. That's like logical in the capitalist system. But then what it's done is, is it's perverted the you know, intelligence gathering institutions to essentially be um, writing the justifications for these wars before these wars happen. Is that conspiracy theory, or is that? I'd say it's complicated, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not Sorry. a no. I think it's, it's not no, a no is what you're not, saying. No, it's the, Why is the, it complicated? Uh, uh, we live in an extremely dangerous world. Uh, uh, but do we This, year, this year. But, but Grant, can I ask you, like, yeah. do, do we really, though? Like, Absolutely. I mean, really? If it, had there not had thousands of people not been taken off the chessboard, you would have seen many repeats of 9-11. Okay. And if you were living in a place, and somebody I know was trying to make a last trade in the morning of 9-11, and a plane crashes in, right. and the building is knocked down, all of a sudden the conversation changes. So there's that. Yeah, I don't want to take the great. gravity Second thing, wait, yeah. wait, that's a, the terrorist piece. Let's take war. This is the other big event most people don't realize. This, year, this month is the anniversary of the end of World War II and the beginning of 78 years in which there's not been another great power war. Right. Excuse me, in history, that's almost unheard of. Why is that? 
answer, well, a lot of good fortune, a lot of grace, but also lots of things that the U.S. did successfully. So I think that the ge ge security dominates everything when you don't have security. And the geopolitics to provide security is very complicated. Now, the structures that do that often end up making big mistakes too. So I'm not trying to make excuses for the mistakes, but I think the overall of it is that the, the security order that's been built in the past and survived for the last 70 right. years has been a big deal. Yeah. I, 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 I grant you that. I so when do you go back? What Shamat said there, which is um, through the framing Shamat has here, we have this military industrial complex, we have this complicated relationship with China, and then we have Taiwan. And we have this incredible policy of ambiguity, uh, and it seemed to be working really well. And now, we, we, are we having the proper debate on Taiwan? What is the debate we should be having on defending Taiwan, not defending Taiwan, providing them with arms? Because you seem to believe in the book that no, this no. is going to be and, and, great. what it's let about. Me add, let me add to that question. And this is going to be our last question, because we do need to move, um, move on. Um, in your role in defense planning, and you look at the Department of Defense today in the US defense industrial complex, are we equipped for a hot conflict with China? And if we're not, does that change the positioning and the strategy that China then has in how they think about what they're going to do next with the US? So the first one is no, we're not. And it certainly impacts China. And in fact, I think if you were able to greenfield uh, the Defense Department today for half the money, you could get twice the bang for the buck. Yeah? Yep. No, so bu bureaucracies are complicated, <laughs> difficult. Uh, the fact that we haven't had another great power war, I'm prepared to pay a little extra for, but if you said, how efficient is it? You know, not, not so much. And then to the, I think the, the, the b big question we should ask ourselves is, uh, for rational actors in Washington, or here today, us, and in Beijing, are there more reasons, more incentives to compete between the US and China? or alternatively, more incentives to cooperate. Right. So we've been through all the ones to compete, but for cooperating, excuse me, if we have a war, we destroy ourselves. So we have a pretty powerful interest in survival in not having a war and not allowing us something happen in Taiwan or this or that. This time. If we live in an enclosed biosphere on a small planet, either party's greenhouse gas emission can make the place unlivable for both of us if we don't find a way to cooperate in dealing with that. We have a financial system that's so entangled that a financial crisis one place can become a depression everywhere. So if we don't find a way to do it. So I would say it's a good assignment for everybody. Make, a, make your list of the reasons incentives to compete and turn the sheet over, incentives right. to cooperate. Yeah. And we need a lot more strategic imagination in that space. Yeah. And I'm hoping some of you guys and, this, and other folks will put some of their gray cells one to that problem. Instead of this de facto posturing that everyone seems to hold today that we're going to go to war, this is our enemy, right. and just be a little more thoughtful about the long-term relationship. Graham Allison, thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Another standing ovation. Be. Be. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Are I'm going on.